we were, you were from the previous presentation on this website, so Euronews, trusted European um, website. And just in the middle, you have the Visit Azerbaijan, <laughs> Azerbaijan Travel. Uh, it looks so the light and the colors. It, it's just an oh, Azerbaijan, why not? I was in Azerbaijan last October, like last September, just before the presidential election. Well, just as right now, I would not necessarily recommend Turkey as your number one holiday destination, Azerbaijan. <laughs> Maybe not to include on your priority holiday destination list either. You have this, these attempts from the Azerbaijani authorities to really paint their image, especially externally, internationally, as this brand new, not brand new country, but New, brand new holiday destination, innovation hub. Uh, they, they are trying really hard to change their image from uh, an authoritarian regime, not to say a dictatorship, to um, this new country which is oil rich, uh, has lots of gas, uh, and is providing actually lots of gas and energy to European countries. Um, they, are involved, they, they have actually a, a PR company, a public relation company that is working really hard also to, for example, when you Google Azerbaijan, so only Google, let's try. Um, so, if I Google Azerbaijan, Happy Planet Index. Uh, Azerbaijan World Cup, oops, World Cup, Britain, it's lots of tourism things apparently, or music, or sports. So, for someone who has absolutely no clue of where is Azerbaijan and what kind of country it is, it's not obvious that it's a country where you can end up in prison for posting a post, for posting something on Facebook. It is not obvious that it's a country where not only freedom of expression, but also freedom of association is strictly repressed, where people have been arrested, beaten up for taking to the streets uh, peacefully. Anyway, you, I think you are getting more and more my, my opinion of, on Azerbaijan, but that's not the point. The point is that last year, Um, last year, several um, political activists, they're not even political activists, they, they call themselves democracy activists, let's say people who are just asking for more freedom and more democratic values to be implemented in Azerbaijan. Uh, they were part of a group called NIDA, which is a, a group of young people asking for democracy in the country. and. The lead, not necessarily the leaders, but those of them who were very, very active on the internet, uh, especially on Facebook in, in Azerbaijan, more than Twitter, um, they were arrested. And until today, they are still in prison. Actually, they've been convicted now. Uh, some of them to up to more than 10 years in prison. Uh, I had the opportunity to actually visit the wife of one of the prisoners, they are really young, I think the younger one was 18 years old, uh, was 18 years old, and the, the oldest one is 25 or 27. So, they are really young people, one of them just had a baby, his wife delivered while he was in prison and he was never allowed to see the baby, and they were arrested, not under Facebook offense or anything because such thing uh, doesn't exist. They were arrested under trumped up charges. They were arrested for drug trafficking or weapon, uh, illegal possession of weapon uh, or organization of, of public disorder. And all they did, they had a Facebook page and they were, they were quite uh, on Facebook, 
criticizing political mal malpractice, criticizing, criticizing the lack of freedom in the country, and, uh, and calling for more freedom. And as the presidential elections uh, were coming, they were being more and more active, which is why several months before the presidential elections, in March, all of them were arrested, um, and as a coincidence, it was all of them were really active on, on social media. So um, this is one of the things that happened. And another case is the case of um, of the newspaper Azadik newspaper. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's one of the remaining. Um, It's one of the remaining independent um, newspapers in, in Azerbaijan and uh, actually they received our journalism award at Index on Censorship. We have a, an annual award uh, rewarding media professionals, uh, free speech advocates, artists who are doing um, uh, an incredible and, and amazing work in the field of freedom of expression and as a big newspapers uh, are little by little dying if I may say so because of um, financial harassment which means that all of their journalists are now systematically being sued for incredible amounts it can be hundreds of thousands um, of euros uh, under defamation, persecution under defamation laws or privacy laws. Um, and of course, for those of you who are freelance journalists or even journalists with a, a little newspaper, I, I'm, I am not going to ask your uh, annual salary, but if it is above uh, the fines that, that, that were given to those journalists, well, well done you. Um, but yeah, it, it's just, those fines are absolutely impossible to pay for those, for those journalists and even organizations who are trying to help them don't even have the resources to help them to pay the fines because it's just astronomic amounts. So that is one thing, the, the independent voices now are being attacked, um, are being attacked through what we call as well financial squeeze, which is trying to shut you down by prosecuting you, by, by suing you every time you publish a story I disagree with, which is which then um, will lead to self censorship. And because if you know that you publish a story and the day after uh, you will be involved in in, in legal uh, proceedings when quite often you know you will lose because the relationship between um, between the court and judges and public officials are sometimes quite tight um, well you will just decide at some point that it's not worth it and for people who have a family you have kids you've got um, you, you might not want either to end up in prison or in jail for, for publishing your story, so the, the chilling effect of, of financial squeeze is a, is a real concern uh, in Azerbaijan, and that's the case in other countries. The UK, until recently, until the reform of the, of the libel law, the UK was called um, the libel tourism de destination, which means that if, especially private companies, disagreed with uh, information published about them, they would sue journalists, reporters, or individuals in the UK. The, and, and the problem was that over, over there, the, the legal costs are so expensive that even if you, at the end of it, you're found not guilty, you have already indebted yourself just to cover uh, daily legal costs. And finally, something else that is happening in the country is also hacking and, and DDoS attack. And as a region was, was a victim of, of this, which means that uh, shortly after 
were publishing really sensitive uh, information, their sites would be would be under attack, so it would it would be inaccessible. Uh, I'm not going to enter too much into the technique, but it's basically you you set up lots of connections all of a sudden to to the website, so that you so that the server is overwhelmed. So you overwhelm the server until it breaks down, and then it becomes accessible. And, and you're, you're doing this, you're sending lots of fake connections to, to just break the, the website. And sometimes it's irreversible. Sometimes you, depending on the hackers and depending on the attack, uh, it can be really difficult to recover from, from this kind of attack. So these all cyber attacks and, and and hacking are, are real because some websites have shut down, some blogs have been shut down and have not have not been reopened ever since. And the arrest under Trump charges are are real as well. I think the last the last case was um, a journalist called Abdul Abidov. Uh, it was just in March, so it, it's quite recent, uh, and he was. He, he was running a Facebook page, so he's a journalist, but as I said, be, because it's more and more difficult to be an independent uh, journalist in, in Azerbaijan, he was also running a, a Facebook page, which was relatively popular. And he was arrested uh, because he was publishing posts critical to, to the authorities on Facebook. And instead of being charged um, of defamation or privacy infringement, he was charged with illegal possession, storage, manufacturing, and sale of drugs. And that is something that is more and more frequent, is you would be charged for drug trafficking or possession of weapons, um, and, and then everything, your, your social page is closed down, your, it, it's all linked. Which shows that, which is easier for us as free speech organization, denouncing this kind of practice. When a journalist is arrested for drug trafficking or possession of drug, and shortly after his arrest, his Facebook page uh, disappears, it is clear that the, the motives behind the arrest are actually not the the drug, uh, the, the drug trafficking or weapon possession or whatever. Fake uh, offense is fake crime is uh, claimed by, by the authorities, but it's really what is being published and what is being said online that is problematic, and that is the direct target to to this kind of of authorities. And something else I, I mentioned it briefly in, at the beginning is the surveillance of um, the surveillance cyber attacks and. and Cyber bullying. Well, it's difficult to give a lecture on online freedom of expression without mentioning uh, the Snowden revelations and the scandal around uh, mass surveillance. Lots of people have said that it is quite a blurry the line between free speech and mass surveillance. And lots of people have said as well that if I have nothing to hide, mass surveillance is not my problem. I mean, especially when it's for national security, preventing terrorism, uh, maybe mass surveillance is not a problem. And in fact, historically, we've always, um, we've always done spying. It, it, it's no news. I mean, governments have always spied on one another. I mean, all of the big spying fictions. And, and when you look at the, even the stories of James Bond, uh, it's quite often you've got a good country against a bad country, and, and it's really how the, the perception around surveillance and spying um, dominates the, the discourse around surveillance and, and freedom of expression. And quickly, not, not entering too much into this debate, but on a practical level, why um, these kind of surveillance programs are problematic? On a, under a free speech angle is because especially as journalists when a government agent can have access to your emails or your Skype calls, your text messages, um, 
your Facebook convers private conversation. When you're a journalist, you use all of those tools to contact your sources. And if you're not that familiar with encrypted email and encrypted conversation, then you can see just, if we just discuss the protection of sources, uh, then that surveillance becomes a problem, especially when there are absolutely no checks and balances, no legal oversight, and in, in countries such as Azerbaijan, like I was saying, um, the activists of the leader movement who were arrested, they were targeted because of what they were publishing on Facebook. Uh, the government had access not only to their Facebook posts or their Facebook conversations, including those uh, that were private, but they also managed to identify them, to, to find where, where those young people were living. And that was the case in Egypt as well, when people using, um, they had an anonymous Twitter account, let's say, uh, but they were also targeted and, and soon after arrested for posting uh, and for being active on, on Twitter and, and Facebook. So they all have real threats. They, they, they might be actually, um, and, and because they are also, everything happened under the table or it's not as obvious, um, it's not as obvious to prove that your conversation has been monitored. Um, it is all the more chilling because it means that if I am your source, and I know that I want to discuss with you about a very sensitive um, case about uh, a politician, uh, a high-profile politician or a high-profile um, businessman in my country. If I know that the government or the, the people I am incriminating have access to your emails, I might not feel safe to, to share what I know with you. And as a journalist, likewise, if you know that your communications are being monitored, it, it might really chill your practice of journalism, just in your choice, in, in the choice that you, or in the decisions that you make to cover or not cover certain stories. But luckily now, new, new tools and, and new systems are, are really helping uh, journalists and, and media professionals around the world. There is a, a great, a great uh, documentation called Security in a Box. I don't know if you've heard of it. Oh, All right. Yes, well, I, I encourage you to, to go to, to their website and to go through all of their material. It is sometimes overwhelming as well because you realize, oh my god, I need to do all of this to protect myself and my sources. Um, but it, it, it is an, an increasing uh, concern for the practice of journalism in, in the digital age. And I'm not even mentioning now the, the surveillance of submarine cables and, and this kind of things where lots of governments now have access to all of those cables uh, that have not only metadata, but also pure data content, which means that for me it can be really interesting to have access to your metadata and to know at what time you log in to a special website, but it's also interesting to see the content of, of your emails, not only who you are emailing and this kind of thing. So there are, there are other threats. And because of the threats, you also have alternatives and, and new ways to go around uh, the threats, or at least to raise awareness on, on the threats. And just before addressing this, um, this new tool, which is aiming at reporting and mapping media freedom violations in Europe, I would like to discuss briefly about um, Syria Tracker, because we have a journalist from Syria in, in the house, so I don't know if you, if you know Syria Tracker or not. So even more so, you, you will all uh, learn about it. In Syria, as you may know, um, the practice of journalism is really threatened. Local journalists, so Syrian journalists, uh, are a, a species in danger, I'd like to say, because it's 
they were, thre they were threatened, they were targeted uh, inside the country. Not only working in a war environment is a, is a dangerous thing, but where you were a news provider and when you try to, uh, to highlight uh, what is going on, you're even more uh, under, under threat or under attack, and including for international journalists who are going to Syria. There has been already too many cases of, of um, uh, kidnapping uh, and murder of, of media professionals going to, going to Syria, and, and, and Syria tried to in light of this difficulty to get information, because at some point it was just extremely difficult to get information um, and, and to get news about what was going on in Syria, to monitor the situation, uh, some very smart people have, have developed a tool to allow uh, citizens, local journalists, but also citizen journalists, to enter and to, and to fill in uh, news. Uh, using the platform, which is an open source software, uh, a mapping system, which is the one you used as well for, for this tool. And why it really challenged many of the, of the threats to online freedom of expression is because it, it, it guarantees anonymity, uh, it allows citizens to, to become news providers. The, the problem was that certain uh, territorial areas, there was absolutely no access. It was impossible for any kind of journalist to have access to those areas. Phone, phone, um, phone lines were destroyed or shut down, so people were just isolated and ha had no way to, to get their stories out. And Sierra Tracker became, um, became one of the only way to get news, to, to have a reach to, to this population uh, isolated. And, and now they're working closely with NGOs, including medical NGOs, for example, to say there's been an attack in this village, please send a, a unity over there, or even with the United Nations in the counting of, of casualties and this kind of thing. So you can see how, as journalists, digital technologies can really become your friends and can really facilitate your work. And it, it's always related as well with human rights, but also in, in the pure practice of journalism, in looking for stories, getting your stories out, more and more tools exist to, to facilitate those things. And this, this new um, website is, is one of them, and it directly uh, address um, violations. So media freedom violations happening in Europe. So it tackles European countries and candidate countries, uh, I don't know if some of you are already on, on the web on the web page or not. It's not it's not necessary, but I'm going to show you what we need here. So it's um, it's a new website based on the on the Yushigi platform, which means that if you try to log in using your your phone, if you have a phone that has access to internet, it's also very easy to to access, very easy to fill in a report, and on the front page you will see this map with lots of red dots and each dot uh, corresponds to a violation. We launched it uh, two weeks ago actually, so it's quite, it's quite recent and uh, we launched it together, uh, Index and Censorship, together with Osservatorio Balcani e Cacanso, who you are talking this afternoon. So maybe they will discuss this as well because it's part of a of a common project uh, funded by the European Union. So you can see that already within two weeks, exactly the same project that funds this bootcamp uh, for journalists, indeed. Um, so you can see that now there is a, a picture that becomes more and more obvious. And the good thing about mapping tools is that the analysis is, is very clear. You, you could see that there is a part of Europe now that has more red dots than others. Something interesting is that countries when you would think, countries that are world ranking really high on press freedom index, I think Denmark is, is one of them, Sweden, um, uh, they, they, they also have cases of, of violations happening. 
And how it works is th this tool has various objectives. The first one is to allow journalists, bloggers, citizen journalists, uh, a news editor, uh, media professionals, when they face a violation, to immediately report it. So something that is really interesting is to know that this tool exists uh, to begin with, but depending on the, the need that you, you require, you can just, it's, it's just really easy to click on submit a report, you give a title, sorry I don't think that's the navigation. You give a title to your report, a description, and then you click on the on the relevant violation. So it can be physical violence, a threat, arrest, detention, interrogation, attack to property, legal measure, loss of employment. Do you verify these reports? That's the that's the next point. Yeah, absolutely. So the idea is that normally. The, the tool is, is uh, primarily aimed at media professionals, but effectively, absolutely anyone can submit a report and, and fill in the form. It's quite easy, you just tick a few boxes, you describe the, the attack or, or the violation, you, you click submit, and we receive the report in the back end. And of course, because sometimes you can receive spam or sometimes we receive reports who are not really press freedom violation. They can be censorship or uh, of an advertisement or, or this kind of thing. So yes, indeed, it's, it's censorship, but it's not really press freedom. So in that case, those, those reports do not appear on the map. But there is a, an extensive verification process uh, on our board, which is a manual thing. And it's very time consuming. Actually, I, I'm responsible for uh, checking a few of the new reports this afternoon normally, we'll see. But, um, but what happens is this, uh, we also have a few regional correspondents spread uh, uh, across the, the various European countries and when we do not have enough information about violations, they can further investigate or if, if we cannot investigate directly, then the regional correspondents and their network can investigate Further, it means that, for example, if you come across a violation and you fill in a report, either you've got absolutely all of the information, the various sources have confirmed the violation you spoke to. If we, you can become a trusted source, or if you are not yet a trusted source, then uh, our regional correspondents or our partners' organisations will get in touch to establish. Um, the veracity of the, of the report. So normally the, the reports who appear on the map are that have been verified and uh, there is still on the technical basis there is a possibility <coughs> to because our problem was that sometimes we are aware that we might come across a case where it's not really possible to verify the information because sometimes it's my word against yours, and if I'm saying that you threatened me, but I don't really have a proof. You visited my office and threatened me not to publish your story, but I, I have no proof. I, I did not film you, or I don't have a record of you threatening me. Sometimes it becomes difficult to certify the information. So there is a possibility to still, but if, if we believe that there is a real threat and that this report, this report is really a violation, that it should appear on the map at least for advocacy purposes or raising awareness of the issue. We can still publish it, but it will have a special sign saying unverified. Um, and and it, it doesn't mean that it hasn't been verified, it means that it is not certified. We were not able to uh, certify 100% that this happened. We, ha we haven't come across this incident, but it is a problem because also as a free speech organization, we do not want to censor uh, journalists, especially journalists who might come and, and sometimes it, it, it's really a step to say, I was a victim of, of a violation. So sometimes 
a publisher refused refuses to publish a story for various reasons. It's not necessarily a, a violation to your to your rights to to expression and information. However, sometimes the the refusal might be politically motivated or, or these kind of things, and, and in that case. Uh, it should be reported, and if you need legal support, or if you need, um, I don't know, let's say you you you, pub, you want to publish a story about corruption, but you receive threats before even publishing the stories, your office is visited, and, and people steal your computer, um, your your family home is attacked, or th there are various ways to try to intimidate or silence you. Um, something that you might want to do to publish the story anyways, either to have someone else publish it, or to have all of a sudden everyone in the world or everyone in Europe speaking about your story and saying, look at what is happening to this journalist. She was working on this case and now this happened and this happened and this happened. And it creates solidarity at the local level, uh, which means that if you're working in a in a specific region, we can we can put you in touch with other journalist unions or other news organizations working in, in the same area. If this is such a big case that uh, that you deem it necessary to to also make some noise around it in international uh, newspapers and, and websites, this is something that we can do as well, depending on the threats and depending on the appropriate response, which is why, um, which is why there are various objectives. The, the first objective is, of course, to provide an easy-friendly tool to report uh, violation. Another thing is, if you're a journalist and you're interested in knowing um, the free speech environment, uh, the free free press environment around you, you can you can register and you can save alerts. You can receive alerts. Uh, we're in Italy, let's say. So, it has found Florence. So, I will just enter my email address and depending on the, the threats and the violations, I can, I can receive uh, all of the information around all of the, the reports that we verify and that we publish on the map. As soon as we verify them, you will receive them instantly. So it, it, it's also, it's the same, it's to create more solidarity as well amongst uh, journalists and especially amongst freelancers who are not necessarily protected by a legal team as part of their uh, media company or, or not necessarily aware sometimes of their rights. As I said, uh, defamation and privacy laws are not the same in Italy, in France, in Spain, in Serbia. So it's important for, for those journalists to know that there is a website that they can use to report violation where they can eventually receive um, appropriate support. And then it's important on an advocacy and raising awareness uh, perspective because I'm just going back to to home. Because here you go, if you if you're doing your research on on free speech or or freedom of expression and in Europe well, there are lots of cases that you would never hear of, of those cases on uh, traditional big media and broadcast media, and it can be interesting either for your personal investigations or, or research to, to be aware that this is happening. And once again, it raises awareness on, on the general environment for freedom of expression. Um, but, but also, it, it creates more solidarity between um, media professionals, also media researchers, and that's why, I mean, some of you might be academics as well. And there is the possibility to download the reports, so you will be able to open them on, a, on a Excel or another tool uh, with lots of information.
violation, the, lo the, the location of, of the violations, the various categories. So, for, because th this map has everything. So if you really want to create your own map, or let's say you're interested in uh, media violations in media freedom violations in Italy from January to June 2014. Then you just select the information that you want and you do your own research and, 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 and study around it. So we, we really hope that this is something that can, that can really be of use for, for not only uh, media practitioners but also for researchers, human rights activists or, or free speech advocates. Uh, to to really know that this is still happening in Europe. First of all, it's I know I mentioned uh, India. Um, well, I could have mentioned Russia, China. I mean, there are countries where uh, freedom of expression, especially online, uh, is clearly repressed. And just to finish on on China, maybe because. Um, because I mentioned lots of threats and challenges to all that freedom of expression, but uh, I think I, I have tried to always balance it with opportunities and at least ways to counter uh, those threats and those challenges. And in China, it's really interesting because, as you know, uh, Facebook, Twitter, all of this is absolutely banned. Uh, and over there, unlike Turkey, it is not possible to to go around the, the technical implementation of the ban. You, you just cannot access uh, Twitter and Facebook. However, you have uh, Weibo, which is the equivalent of, of Twitter in China. And, uh, and it's very interesting, especially in Europe as we are facing big uh, unemployment challenges. Well, uh, a job now in China is to be a monitor of social media, which means that your, your role is to monitor everything that is published on Twitter and to censor and remove everything that is critical to, to the government. So you can imagine China, uh, you can imagine the amount of information and of, um, it's not tweets, but it's the equivalent of tweets but on Weibo that are being uh, shared within a minute. So it just creates lots of job it, to, to have someone to, to have people to monitor and to censor immediately uh, online content on 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 Weibo. And in order to go around once again uh, those um, this institutionalized censorship, uh, there was this uh, new organization called Free Weibo. And what they do is they check everything that was censored and everything that was uh, taken off Weibo, and they publish it. So it, it's really interesting because you